Good morning, church. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Good to have you here today. Wow, what a great day it is. Oh, I love that video. I cried twice. And is Tom Beggs here? No. Can I just go on record to say, I want to be Tom Beggs. <laughs> and uh, it's like, that's a goal in life. I just love it. I just love him. He is such a wonderful man. Uh, we were blessed uh, to hear from fathers today. It is Father's Day. It's also where week number three in a series called The Christian Walk. And uh, I'm going to talk today about walking in power, but actually it's really a message about love um, because love has a tremendous power. It's the greatest power in the world. The love of Jesus is the greatest power in the world. Amen? And uh, I'm excited for the message today. Um, usually, uh, you know, it's a good day. It's Father's Day. It's a good day for um, a conversation on relationships. So we'll talk about love and relationship. It's kind of funny because um, on Mother's Day, we usually talk about how great moms are. And then on Father's Day, we're like, five ways to be a better dad, right? <laughs> Don't worry, guys, I'm not going to beat up on you today. We're in this one together. This message applies regardless of who you are and where you are. The goal of this message is to access the understanding of the love of Jesus and the unmatched power of that love for ourselves and for others. Are you ready for that? Somebody is. Okay, listen, I want to encourage you. This is a take notes kind of message. Um, and so if you're a note taker, this is, this is your message. If you're not a note taker, uh, you might want to jump on the app, the GT Victoria app, because in there, um, there is a kind of a sketch of notes. You can fill stuff in. But I want to encourage you, this is a message that kind of needs to grow on you. It's one of those messages that when you hear it, you'll be thinking about it, hopefully. You'll be thinking about it this week. There'll be elements that will come back to you. And uh, so just, just be ready for that. I'm going to walk you through Ephesians 3, verses 14, uh, down through uh, verse 19. I'm going to break it up into two different pieces, and then at the very end, I'll give you like a couple more verses, and that's going to be kind of our biblical text for the day. And so Paul, who is the writer to the Ephesians, he was writing to this church in Ephesus, and he was encouraging them. In chapter 1, we saw the power of unity, which is the mega theme of the whole book. And then um, in last week, we talked about walking in grace. We talked about how the grace of God has been given to us, and that's how we're actually saved. It's not from us. It's not by works. It's by grace through faith. And now this week, we're going to look at this theme of love and how love empowers us to live in a certain way. It's the Christian walk. And so I want to jump into the text now, verse 14. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. Paul is expressing his prayer. The interesting thing is he says, I kneel before the Father. When Hebrews would pray, they stood with hands extended and palms up. And so for him to say he's kneeling was to take a tremendous posture of humility. So he's saying, I just want you to know that I'm praying for you with humility. And I'm praying for you before the Father. And then in verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. So that's that mega theme again. That's unity, whether Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter who you are, where you've come from. Every family derives its name from the Father in heaven. He is the creator of life. Verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, there's a lot in that verse. So let me just kind of back it up for just a second. Paul is praying that the Spirit of God, capital S, the Holy Spirit, would help us, empower us, to be able to experience the love of Christ in our inside. Now, the Greeks had a particular way of looking at the concept of the inner being. The inner being really made up three different things for, in the mind of the Greek. When this was written in Greek, and it was written to a Greek audience in Ephesus. Now, understand this. What Paul's referring to is the reason, the conscience, and the will. And so it's about, it's about three different elements. It's about knowing, it's about believing, and it's about doing. And so when Paul introduces this idea, he's basically saying that, that you would know, and you would believe, and you would do the work of the Spirit in the inner man, and then he says, so that 
Christ can dwell in your hearts. So in other words, the spirit has to do something in the will, in the reason, and in the conscience in order for Christ to truly dwell in the hearts. And this word dwell that's used here, it's a Greek word. And this Greek word, it, gives, it denotes the idea of permanent residence versus temporary housing. So in other words, when the spirit gets involved in your life, Christ comes and dwells in you, and that's a permanent thing. That's a permanent residence, and that's what he's praying. I pray that this permanent dwelling of Christ would be found in you, that the power of the Spirit would allow this to take place. And then he goes on, and this really is the chunk that we're going to dissect together. It's the second half of verse 17. He says, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be feel, filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Pray with me, won't you? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is so alive. And Lord, even as we look at this text together today, we know, Holy Spirit, that we need you to bring illumination to the word. We need you to help us understand what it is that we're actually seeing here. Lord, I thank you for the insights of the Apostle Paul. And I pray, Lord, that we would receive insight today. That we would understand that as Christians, we're called to walk in the power of love. And that you would lead us now as we look at this passage together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Remember, our goal today is to access the unmatched power of the love of Jesus and use it for ourselves and for others. And so what Paul is actually saying in that last little passage that I just read to you is that his prayer is that we would know what love is. We would learn what love is and that we would learn how to love our brothers and our sisters in Christ and those beyond the family of God and that we would be filled with the fullness of God because why? God is love. So it really roots the whole concept in love and the power of love. I want to talk about that today. Paul prayed this because this doesn't just naturally happen. If it naturally happened, why would he pray for it? He's praying, God, do something supernatural here. And when we read a verse like this, how high, how long, how deep, how wide is the love of Jesus? We go, yes, Lord, send the love. He loves us. Oh, right? That's why Luke sings, not me. <laughs> and we would say, yes, I want that. But it doesn't naturally happen. It's not something we just thank God for. It's something that we engage with. And so when we talk about love, we're back to the idea that love is a verb. Love is an action word. Love requires something of us. And if we're going to love well the world around us, something will be demanded of us. And that's why Paul prays, oh, that you could just figure this out. If you could figure out how to have this kind of love, if the Spirit could work in you so that Christ could dwell and you'd understand Christ's love, how big it really is, then you could love others in such a tremendous way and live in that love. And so I want to give you four thoughts based on what Paul says here that I believe will help you understand, begin to unpack the idea of this kind of love. The first one is this, love takes time. Love takes time. I like that Paul says being rooted and established in love. You know, it kind of gives you this idea of the garden. And although we haven't had much of a summer, we did have a little bit of a spring. And who planted flowers or plants or anything like that this spring? Anybody? I see a couple of hands. This is not, this is not an indictment. You're not in trouble. Did anybody plant anything? Yeah, we did. We certainly planted things. And when you, when you plant them, you know, you, you can put a seed in the ground, but who has time for that, right? So we get the plants. We plant plants, right? Yeah. Did you know they come from seeds? I know it's hard to believe, but I mean, they're at the store. They're already there. Why would you buy a seed when you can buy the plant, right? Anyway, so you take the plant, you stick it in the ground, and your hope is, is that it roots, right? That it starts to be established, that the roots grow in deep, that it actually takes root. That's the hope. And so Paul gives us this analogy. Man, I'm just hoping, I'm praying that you'll be rooted and you'll be established in love. 
Love is the container of this whole thing. Love is what holds this whole thing. I want you to, like a plant, dig down deep. Let your roots go down deep. Be established. You know, I have different plants in my garden, and I have a lavender bush. Does anybody have lavender? Lavender devours the world. I don't know what's going on. My lavender is just growing everywhere. I chop it back every year, and it grows. And then I have this sweet, little, precious calla lily. It doesn't grow for anything. I do not know what's going on with it. It's like beside the lavender, and the lavender is eating it. And I'm always cutting the lavender back, and it has these sweet little three little lilies, and that's it. Lisa, we planted that thing like 10 years ago or more. That's pretty sad. But what it says to me is that things get rooted and established at different rates, right? And and there's something to that. We have to understand that we would hope over time, like a plant, that the roots would go deeper, that it would be established in a better way. And, And I think Paul says, hey, if you establish that, if you plant that in love, it will take root. But you know what I've discovered is that plants become more and more rooted as they mature. And you know what else? People aren't necessarily the same. Oh, yeah, that was a good groan. I'll take the groan. Why? Because because people can grow older without growing more mature. I know. I know. (laughs) It is possible. I'm telling you. Older but not more mature. You know, I've discovered in my own life that you can actually love less as you age because you become more irritated and confused. (laughs) I'm speaking about myself. We have all this technology in the office now. Like, I just want you to put it on a piece of paper and put it in my hand. And they're like, oh, no, no, it's on the Google. It's on the docs. It's on the... What else is it on? The drive. It's, it's hidden. I can't find it. I just want to punt my computer every day. So frustrating. And then they come into my office and I say, if you tell me it's on the docks, I'm going to smack you. I'm just telling you, you can, you, know, you can become more irritated, more confused, less loving as you age. And that's why this message is so important, because there really is a powerful principle here when we're talking about love, and it's this. Love is the measure of maturity. I'm just going to let that one sit a minute, because that's a big one. I've actually thought about this a lot. Love is the measure of maturity. The measure to which you're able to love people is the true sign of how mature you are in Jesus. And for me, that's quite impactful. It's not my money, it's not my eloquence, it's not my age, it's not my position, but it's my love that is the indicator of my maturity. And please hear me. Isn't that what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 13? That you can have everything, but if you don't have love, you're what? Nothing. Isn't that powerful? This thought is real. This is true. Love is the measure of a life of substance. And that's really what we're going for here. So may God help you be rooted and established in love. And so here's the question. How's your love? (laughs) <laughs> this is hard. I know this is a tough question, but think about this. How's your love with those that you disagree with? I, I mean, are you able to truly love those that you disagree with, those who have an opposite point of view on particular issues that are of, uh, of value to you? Uh, this is the one for me. This is the one I'm working on. When I'm confronted, can I stay open or do I close myself off? When I'm confronted by my spouse, when I'm confronted by a friend, when I'm confronted by a parent, when I'm confronted by a child, do I stay open or do I close myself off? I mean, this comes to bear every day in my house because I have one thing that is unperfect in my life. And Lisa has a tendency to point that out. She thinks there's two, but I'm certain there's only one. (laughs) And the point that I'm, I'm making is I'm actually going through that process. I'm trying to learn this, and I'm like, can I stay open? 
when this conversation happens again? Right? <laughs> Can I stay open? Because love is the measure of maturity, and this is a person that I love, and this is a person that I know loves me as well. How do I stay open in this conversation? And to me, this is the measure of maturity. This is how I'm learning the substance of life in my love. How about your enemies? Can you say that you're able to love those that truly would love to see you fail? See, these are confronting and difficult questions to answer. And I bring these tensions to the surface because I want us to wrestle with them. And the reason why is because many of us would hear that Pastor Andy's preaching a message on love and we would determine that this is a great time to take our Sunday nap because we already know about love and it's good. He loves us, oh how. But there's something more for us here. Paul says, being rooted and established in love. And you know what that means? That means that your roots are growing past the topsoil, in through the rock, finding a way to be deeply established. It's hard work, and that's why Paul prayed for us. He prayed it because it's not easy and it's not natural. It's difficult to be rooted and established in love, but it is the measure of Christian maturity. And so, Lord, help us. Thank God that Paul prayed it for us. Second thing I'll tell you is that love takes others. You know, it's really easy to love yourself all by yourself. It's hard to love when there's other people around, isn't it? It's more difficult, much more difficult to love when there's other people involved. And so as Paul continues praying for us, he says it this way, that you would experience power together with all the Lord's holy people. He's talking about the church, that you would experience power together with the church to love because love takes other people. Oh, I've been so challenged by, uh, you know, a a book that, that was written in 1923 by a man named Martin Buber, and it's called I and Thou. And he talks about two types of human relationships that we can have. We can have an I and it relationship with people or an I and thou relationship with people. The book is a hard read, but I'll give you the gist of it. Basically, when Martin Buber was a younger man, he was, um, he's a religious leader, and he was called upon it many times to care for people. But he really loved God and really loved being with God and loved to draw away from people like Jesus did to be with God. But the problem is, is he would have a difficult time re-engaging. And when he re-engaged with people, he just wanted to return to his time with God. And so one time, Martin Buber had just come from a time of real uh, wonder and glory in God's presence, and he he returned to his office to find a young man sitting there. He shares, he hears this young man, the young man sharing. He's listening, he's giving advice, he's giving direction, but really all he can think about is, I really want this to end so that I can go back to my time with God. And the story goes on, because Martin Buber writes the book based on what happens to that young man, because that young man gets up, leaves his office, and within a short time had committed suicide. This so struck Martin Buber. He said, I can be so close to God and so far from people. And Paul says, I want you to understand that part of this rooting is having power together with all the Lord's people. There are people around you for a reason. I can have an I and it relationship to other people, or I can have an I and thou relationship. Let me explain what Martin Buber meant. In the I-it relationship, we actually objectify others. And when we see people, we see them, but yet we're distracted and we're preoccupied. We can view others as a means to an end. You have something I need. You are a commodity that I need. Or we view others as, as, um, as though we're interacting with them, but we're actually just waiting for the next moment to say what matters to us instead of listening. We're just speaking. There's a monologue, not a dialogue. When I'm in an I-it relationship, I grow irritable. I'm judgmental. I'm closed. I'm unwilling to learn or change, and I lack vulnerability. But in the I-thou relationship, I humanize everyone. 
every person that I come in contact with, I put the intrinsic value of someone being made in the image of God. And when I look at them, when I sit with them, I see people and I look at them and I'm fully attentive upon them because they matter and they're important. I see others as a gift to me and I'm ready to learn at any moment in any relationship. I'm curious. I'm accepting. I'm non-judgmental. I'm open and I'm ready. I see the interaction as a dialogue where I can learn and they can learn too. That is the I and thou relationship. And so I want you to think about it. Think about your last five interactions with someone, maybe even today, in the lobby, on the phone, your spouse, your child, your parent. How did it go with your roommate? What were those interactions like? Were they I and it? Interactions and conversations or I and thou? And I think in order for us to truly love, we have to understand that it takes others. And they are there, even annoying as they are, they are there to help me learn what love really looks like, to help me understand what love really requires of me. And I want to give you three questions that you can ask yourself as you engage in these kind of moments where you have the opportunity to be fully present, to be someone who loves. I want you to ask yourself these three questions to help you practice the I and thou relationship. And that's this. Am I fully present or am I distracted? Am I loving or am I judging? And thirdly, am I open or closed to being changed? It's interesting to note that theologians from the past believed that there was a common grace given to all men, regardless of their religious perspective. John Calvin spoke of the ancient Greeks and said there is much for us to learn. Friends, I want you to know that if you can see someone as created in the image of God, it really doesn't have to begin with their religious alignment with you. You can be open. And you can make a difference in someone else's life. This is the power of living in the love of Christ and expressing it to others. So yes, love takes other people, but love also takes incarnation. As, as Paul continues here, I just love what he says next. I want you to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. This is incarnation. Christ came to us. The word incarnation means to take on flesh. And isn't that what Jesus did? He became human to show us God's love. That was the point. He wanted us to be able to see the love of God. And so what did he do? He entered our world. And yet he held on to himself. Jesus was completely differentiated. In other words, he, he, you know, it's funny. When you think about the life of Jesus on earth, he disappointed everybody. He disappointed his, his mom. He disappointed his brothers. They all thought he should do something different. He disappoints the disciples. He certainly disappointed the religious leaders. He disappointed the crowds, but he always pleased his father. Why? Because he knew who he was and who he belonged to. And so even though he came to earth, even though he became like us, he always held on to himself. And you know what he did is he lived in the tension of those two realities. And I just see in this a broader definition of being incarnational. I see a broader definition here to allow Jesus to be present in us, to allow Christ to become visible in us, understanding this, that how Christ embodied love challenges us to do the exact same. I want you to think about this with me as I tell you a, a quick story. I want to tell you the story of Sister Helen Prezan. She wrote a book called Dead Man Walking. She and she chronicled in the, in the early 1990s her experience with death row inmates as someone who brought spiritual care to them. She tells the story of one man in particular that she walked with who had committed a heinous crime and was going to be punished with the death sentence. This is in the south of the United States. And she began to engage with him and found him to be a foul and really difficult individual. He said horrific things. He was a racist. He was a, a bigot. He was a, a murderer and a rapist. 
And yet she engaged with him and refused to objectify him, but humanized him over and over again. She entered his world, and yet she held on to herself. She saw it as the work of Christ. She saw it as her work for him. And at 1153, he was to be executed at 12. At 1153, as she continued to engage with him, she said to him, are you ready to confess what you have done and to take responsibility? And he finally broke, he wept, and he confessed to everything that he had done. And then he looked at her and he said, thank you for loving me. No one has ever loved me before. Friends, that doesn't happen if you don't enter someone's world. But it also doesn't happen unless you hold on to yourself. You have to know why you're in their world. You're in their world to show them Jesus. You're in their world to love them well. And you can imagine the third part of that that I've shared with you is the tension that that creates. Imagine the family of those who had lost their children to this terrible man. Imagine the tension that that put Sister Helen in as she engaged with not only this man, but with the families. And the story goes that when he was walking down the hallway to the chair where he would receive the lethal injection, she said, it was the first time I ever touched him because I knew something transformed in him. And he said to her, she said to him, when you're in the chair, look at my face. So when you die, you will see the face of someone who loves you. And that's exactly what hap- happened. He stared at her, and then he died. And so he died understanding love rather than bitterness and rage and the evil that was inside of him. Friends, even sharing that story, you feel the tension. But that's where Christ calls his church. Right? Right to those places. Love takes incarnation. If we're going to love properly, we're going to have to let Jesus flow through us. It's messy. It's challenging. But it's so good. It's so beautiful and so transformative. So let's be willing to enter the world of others, holding on to ourselves and living in the tension. And then as I close, I want to share just one last thought with you that comes right from what Paul prayed. And that is that love takes supernatural learning. Love takes a supernatural learning. He says, I want you to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Does anyone else see the paradox in that? I want you to know what surpasses knowledge. How in the world do I do that? Unless it's supernatural. I can't know what I don't know. I can't know what's beyond knowledge. And so Paul keeps talking here. He gets to the end of that verse, and then he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Are you seeing it? I know you can't do it, but God can. He can do the immeasurably more. He can do this through his power. It says, To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. It's supernatural learning. The impossible becoming possible when we choose the power of love. And the Spirit wants to help us. And you know what's been very encouraging to me? Is that there really are layers of learning. You know, if you were to look into Benjamin Bloom's taxonomy of learning, he, he describes it quite deeply. But the one thing that just encourages me is that there's layers to learning. And it starts with hearing something. And you've heard something today. And part of it will stick. And can I encourage you with the part that sticks, will you, will you apply it? Try and use it. You can't remember everything that was said. And if you took notes, that might help you a little bit. But the truth is, the way learning works is we remember something, we, we, we think about it, 
then we try it, then we evaluate it, then we try it again, and eventually it actually just becomes a part of us. And those layers of learning are what we're asking the Lord to activate. Wherever you are today, just let the Lord lead you into what's next. Don't become overwhelmed by the idea of all that is here. Just understand that the goal is to grow in love. And if we listen, then we'll learn. If we stay open, we can grow. I want to pray with you now. Bow your heads with me, will you? Maybe you're here today. And what you need is you need the love of Christ in your own life. I've talked about the love of Christ as the most powerful, the most powerful force in our universe. And I mean that with all my heart. It was that powerful love that allowed Jesus Christ to hang in the tension, if you will, between heaven and earth on a cross because he loves us. That powerful love transformed the world and it can transform your life as well. If you don't know the love of Christ, if you've never experienced the embrace of Jesus, I wanna encourage you, open your life to him. Just simply say, Jesus, come into my life. Come and dwell with me. Come and dwell in me. Take, as this verse said, that permanent residence in me. You can do that right now. For others of us, I think we're facing the challenge of needing a supernatural capacity to learn and to live this kind of love. And I believe the Spirit can begin that work right now as we pray. And I also believe that there are people here who are dealing with a person that seems impossible to love. And I believe that God wants to help you. God wants to give you a love that is supernatural, that's beyond you, that you can actually enter the world of others, hold on to yourself, and survive in that tension. So here's what I want to do. I want us to ask the Holy Spirit to answer Paul's prayer in us. Because he wrote this to the Ephesians, but he wrote it to the church, and he writes it to you and to me. And so I want you just with your heads bowed, eyes closed, position of receptivity. Let me now read those verses that we've been studying together today back over you, but as they were intended now, not as a theological exercise, but as a prayer for you. And receive it all as I pray. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. And all of us say together, amen. Amen.